Edward Lee Thorndike, 1874 to 1949. One of the most important researchers in the development of animal psychology, Thorndike fashioned a mechanistic objective learning theory that focused on overt behavior. Thorndike believed that psychology must study behavior, not mental elements or conscious experiences. And thus he reinforced the trend toward greater objectivity begun by the functionalists. He did not interpret learning subjectively, but rather in terms of concrete connections between stimuli and responses, although he did permit some reference to consciousness and mental processes. The works of Thorndike and Ivan Pavlov, which we will mention in another reading, provide an example of independent uh, simultaneous discovery. Simultaneous discovery. Thorndike developed his law of effect in 1898, and Pavlov proposed a similar law of reinforcement in 1902. Edward Lee Thorndike was one of the first American psychologists to receive all of his education in the United States. It is significant that this was possible, that he did not have to travel to Germany for graduate study just two decades after the formal founding of psychology. His interest in psychology was awakened, as it was for so many others, when he read William James's The Principles of Psychology, while an undergraduate at Wesleyan University in Middletown, Connecticut. Thorndike later studied under James at Harvard and began his investigation of learning. He had planned to conduct his research with children as subjects, but that was forbidden. The university administration was still sensitive about a scandal involving charges that an anthropo anthropologist had loosened children's clothing to take their body measurements. When Thorndike learned that he could not study children, he chose chickens instead, or chicks, baby chickens. He may have been inspired by the lectures given by Morgan, describing his research with chicks. Thorndike improvised mazes by stacking books on end and trained his chicks to run through them. The story is told that Thorndike had difficulty finding a place to house his chicks. His landlady refused to allow him to keep the birds in his bedroom. So he asked William James for advice. James was unsuccessful in finding space in the laboratory or the university museum. So he took Thorndike and the chicks into the basement of his home to the delight of James's children. Thorndike did not complete his education at Harvard. Believing that a certain young lady did not return his affection, he applied to James McKean Cattell at Columbia University to get away from the Boston area. When Cattell offered him a fellowship, Thorndike went to New York, taking with him his two best trained chicks. He continued his animal research at Columbia, working with cats and dogs in puzzle boxes of his own design. He was awarded his doctoral degree in 1898. His dissertation was titled Animal Intelligence, with the subtitle An Experimental Study of the Associative Processes in Animals. End quote. And it, and it was published in the Psychological Review and enjoys the distinction of being the first psychology doctoral dissertation to use animal subjects. Thorndike later published considerable subsequent research on associative learning in chicks, fish, cats, and monkeys. Again, on animal intelligence. Fiercely ambitious and competitive, Thorndike wrote to his fiancée, Quote, I've decided to get to the top of the psychology heap in five years, teach ten more, and then quit. Uh, end quote. He did not remain an animal psychologist for long. He admitted that he had no real interest in it, but had struck with it only to complete his degree and establish a reputation. Animal psychology, as we have seen, was not the field for someone with an intense drive to succeed. There were many more job opportunities in applied areas than in animal research. Thorndike, however, became an instructor in psychology at Teachers College of Columbia University, where he worked with human subjects on problems of learning, adapting his animal research techniques for children and young people. He branched out to educational psychology and mental testing. He wrote several textbooks and in 1910 founded the Journal of Educational Psychology. He was at the top of the psychology heap in 1912 when he was elected president of the APA. Royalties from his tests and textbooks made him very wealthy, 
and by 1924, he boasted an income of nearly $70,000, an amount equivalent to almost $1 million in the year 2014. So, Thorndike's 50 years at Columbia University are among the most productive ever recorded in the entire history of psychology. His bibliography lists 507 items. Although he retired in 1939, he continued to work until his death 10 years later in 1949. Thorndike called his experimental approach to the study of association connectionism. He wrote that if he were to analyze the human mind, he would find, quote, connections of varying strength between A, situations, elements of situations, and compounds of situations, and B, responses, readiness to respond, facilitations, inhibitions, and directions of responses. Learning is connecting. The mind is man's connect connection system. Um, again, <clears throat> connectionism is Thorndike's approach to learning that was based on connections between situations and responses. This position was a direct extension of the older philosophical notion of association, which we had discussed later, I mean earlier, which, which we discussed earlier in our philosophical influences reading. But with one significant difference, instead of talking about associations or connections between ideas, Thorndike was dealing with connections between objectively verifiable situations and responses. Although Thorndike developed his theory within a more objective frame of reference, he continued to invoke mental processes. He used such terms as satisfaction, annoyance, and discomfort. When discussing the behavior of his experimental animals, descriptive words that are more mentalistic than behavioristic. Thus Thorndike retained the influence of many psychologists, his objective analysis of animal behaviors often incorporated subjective judgments about the animal's alleged conscious experiences. We note, however, that Thorndike was not freely granting high levels of consciousness and intelligence to animals as extravagantly as many others had. Uh, you can see a steady reduction in the importance of consciousness in animal psychology from its beginnings along with an increasing use of the experimental method to study behavior. In spite of the mentalistic tinge to Thorndike's work, his approach was strongly in the mechanistic tradition. He argued that behavior must be reduced to its simplest elements, the stimulus response units. He shared with the structuralist and the British empiricist before them a mechanistic, analytical, and atomistic point of view. Stimulus response units are the elements of behavior, not of consciousness and are the building blocks from which more complex behaviors are compounded. Thorndike designed and built crude puzzle boxes out of wooden crates and sticks for his research on animal learning. To escape from the box, the animal had to learn to operate a latch. Thorndike traced the, the, his idea for the puzzle box as an apparatus for studying learning to the anecdotal reports of other psychologists like Romains and Morgan that described the way cats and dogs opened latches on gates. In one series of experiments, Thorndike placed a food-deprived cat in, a, in the slated box. Food was left outside the box as a reward for escaping. The cat had to pull a lever or chain and sometimes engage in several acts in succession to unfasten the latches and open the door. At first, the cat displayed random behaviors, poking, sniffing, and clawing to get at the food. Eventually, by trial and error, the cat executed the correct behavior and unlatched the door. Using the first trial, that behavior occurred by accident. Of course, on subsequent trials, the random behaviors were displayed less frequently until learning was complete. Then the cat would exhibit the appropriate behavior as soon as it was put back in the box again. To record his data, Thorndike used quantitative measures of learning. One technique was to log the number of incorrect behaviors, actions, that did not lead to escape. Over a series of trials, the number of these behaviors diminished. Another technique was to record the elapsed time, the duration, from the moment the cat was placed in the box until it succeeded in escaping. As learning took place, this time period decreased. Of course, we see the duration um, decreasing. We see that learning is occurring. So Thorndike wrote about stamping in and stamping out. 
a response tendency by its favorable or unfavorable consequences. Of course, unsuccessful response tendencies that did nothing to get the cat out of the box tended to disappear, to be stamped out over a number of trials. Response tendencies that led to success were stamped in after a number of trials. This kind of learning has come to be known as trial and error learning, although Thorndike preferred to call it trial and accidental success. Uh, this trial and accidental success, or trial and error learning, is learning based on the repetition of response tendencies that lead to eventual success. Of course, uh, most people just know this as trial and error. Uh, learning based on repetition of response tendencies that eventually lead to success. Thorndike formally presented his ideas about the stamping in or stamping out of a response tendency as the law of effect. The law of effect is any act, he says, in which a given situation produces satisfaction becomes associated with that situation so that when the situation recurs, the act is more likely than before to recur also. Conversely, any act which in a given situation produces discomfort becomes disassociated from that situation so that when the situation recurs, the act is less likely than before to recur. He wrote that in 1905. Again, the law of effect is that acts that produce satisfaction in a given situation become associated with that situation. When the situation recurs, the act is likely to occur. A companion law called the law of exercise, or the law of use and disuse, states that any response made in, in a particular situation becomes associated with that situation. The more the response is used in the situation, the more strongly it becomes associated with it. Conversely, prolonged disuse of the response tends to weaken the association. In other words, simply repeating a response in a given situation tends to strengthen that response. Further research persuaded Thorndike that the reward consequences of a response, a situation that produces satisfaction, are more effective than mere repetition of the response. Through an extensive research program using human subjects, Thorndike later re-examined the law of effect Again, an acts that produce satisfaction in a given situation become associated with that situation. When the situation occurs, the act is likely to occur. And so the results revealed that rewarding a response did indeed strengthen it, but punishing a response did not produce a comparable negative effect. He revised his views to place greater emphasis on reward than on punishment as a way of changing behavior. Of course, the law of exercise again to recapitulate, the more an act or response is used in a given situation, the more strongly the act becomes associated with that situation. Thorndike's investigations of human and animal learning are among the most significant research programs in the entire history of psychology. His work heralded the rise of learning theory to prominence in American psychology, and the objective spirit in which he conducted his research was an important contribution to behaviorism. Watson, John Watson, wrote that Thorndike's research laid the foundation for behaviorism, and Ivan Pavlov also paid tribute to Thorndike. Pavlov said in 1928, quote, Some years after the beginning of the work with our new method, I learned that somewhat similar experiments had been performed in America, and indeed not by physiologists, but by psychologists. I must acknowledge that the honor of having made the first steps along this path belongs to E. L. Thorndike. By two or three years, his experiments preceded ours, and his book must be considered a classic, both for its bold outlook on an immense task and for the accuracy of its results. End quote. Now we go to Vladimir M. Bekhterev. 1857 to 1927, Vladimir Bekhterev is another important figure in the development of animal psychology and behaviorism. He helped lead the field away from subjective ideas in philosophy toward objectively observed overt behavior in psychology. Although less well known than Ivan Pavlov, this Russian physiologist, neurologist, and psychiatrist was a pioneer in several research areas. He was a political, radical, openly critical of the Tsar and the Russian government. 
He accepted women and Jews as students and colleagues at a time when they were excluded from Russian universities. Bekhtarev received his degree from St. Petersburg Military Medical Academy in 1881. He studied at the University of Leipzig with Wundt, took additional courses in Berlin and Paris, and returned to Russia to accept a professorship in mental diseases at the University of Kazan. In 1893, he was appointed chair of mental and nervous disease at the Military Neurological Institute, which now bears his name. Bekhtarev and Pavlov became enemies after Pavlov published a negative review of one of Bekhtarev's books. Uh, <clears throat> quote, the enmity between Bekhtarev and Pavlov was so pronounced that they would insult each other in the street. If they ran into each other at the same Congress, they would soon be embroiled in dispute. Forming cliques uh, and slinging snide shots at each other, they were engaged in a constant struggle to expose one another's faults and weaknesses. No sooner had some people of Bekhtarev made a public statement than it was paired or parried by Pavlov's retort, which followed virtually as a conditioned reflex. End quote. In 1927, ten years after the Bolshevik Revolution, uh, which, as, as you know, occurred in um, 1817, uh, toppled the Tsar, Bekhtarev was summoned to Moscow to treat Joseph Stalin, who was said to be suffering from depression. Uh, Bekhtarev examined the dictator and told him the diagnosis was severe paranoia. Uh, and, and you got to think here, um, if Stalin has extreme paranoia and he had depression, you know, when he said that Hitler indeed had escaped um, <clears throat> from Germany after the war and went to Argentina like Mengele, uh, we, you got to think about that. You know, I got to think about you know, what are the underlying conditions of this, this person that makes this statement? Um, of course, there was no body found, but it doesn't make Stalin a credible source. But you got to think about these kinds of things. Um, so, anyway, suspiciously, Bekhtarev died that afternoon after giving the diagnosis of a dictator, Joseph Stalin, with severe paranoia. Of course, no, no autopsy was permitted and the body was quickly cremated. It, it, it was suggested that Stalin had Bekhtarev poisoned as revenge for the psychiatric diagnosis. Uh, Stalin later ordered Bekhtarev's research work su suppressed and had his son executed. In 1952, a year before Stalin died, uh, since so Stalin died in 1953, the Soviet Union issued a postage stamp honoring Bekhtarev. Whereas Pavlov's conditioned re research focused Almost exclusively on glandular secretions, uh, Bekhtarev's interest was the motor conditioning response. And uh, we will talk about Pavlov in our next reading. But in other words, what Bekhtarev did was to apply Pavlov's conditioning principles to the muscles. Uh, Bekhtarev's basic discoveries were the associated reflexes revealed through his study of motor responses. He found that reflexive movements such as withdrawing one's finger from the source of an electric shock could be elicited not only by the unconditioned stimulus, the electric shock, but also by stimuli that had become associated with the original stimulus. For example, a buzzer sounded at the time of the shock, soon brought about by itself the withdrawal of the finger. Uh, okay, so to explain associated reflexes, so associated reflexes are reflexes that can be elicited not only by unconditioned stimuli, okay, but also by stimuli that have become associated with the unconditioned stimuli. So we're going we're gonna, to uh, unpack that. So the associationists explained such connections in terms of mental processes, but Bekhtarev considered the reactions to be reflexive. In other words, he believed that higher level behaviors of greater complexity could be explained in the same way, that is, as an accumulation or compounding of lower level motor reflexes. Thought processes were similar in that they depended on interactions of the speech musculature, an idea later adopted by John Watson. Now, Bekhtarev argued for a completely objective approach to psychological phenomena and against the use of mentalistic terms and concepts. He described his ideas in the book Objective Psychology, which he published in 1907. It was translated, translated into German and French in 1913, and a third edition was published in English in 1932 as general principles of human reflexology. <clears throat>
From the beginnings of animal psychology and the work of Remains and Morgan, we have seen a steady movement towards increased objectivity in subject matter and methodology. Uh, the initial work in the field invoked consciousness and mental processes and relied on subjective research methods. But by the early 20th century, animal psychology was completely objective in subject matter and methods. Um, and we, I didn't go over them, but we can thank Romaines and Morgan for, for developing ob objective uh, psychology and animal, animal psychology. Um, but uh, by the early 20th century, as I said before, animal psychology was completely objective in subject matter and methods. Granular secretions, for example, uh, well, that we'll get into by Pavlov, conditional responses, acts, behavior. These terms left no doubt that animal psychology had discarded its subjective past. Animal psychology was soon to become a model for behaviorism, whose leader, Watson, preferred animal to human subjects for his psychological research. Watson made the findings and techniques of the animal psychologist the foundation of a science of behavior applicable to animals and humans alike. Um, so another direct antecedent of behaviorism was function, uh, functionalism. Although not a totally objective school of thought, functional psychology in Watson's day did represent greater objectivity than did its predecessors. Cantell and other functionist, functionalists emphasized behavior and objectivity and expressed dis dissatisfaction with introspection. Mark Arthur May, who lived from 1891 to 1977, was a graduate student at Columbia University in 1915, and he recalled Cattell's visit to his laboratory, quote, May showed Cattell the equipment which impressed him, but when May attempted to show Cattell the introspective reports obtained from the subjects, Cattell muttered, not worth a damn, and stormed out of the lab, end quote. Applied psychologists had little use for consciousness and introspection, and their various specialty areas essentially constituted an objective functional psychology. Even before Watson became on the scene, the functional psychologist had moved away from Wundt's and Titchener's pure psychology of conscious experience. In writings and lectures, some functional psychologists were quite specific in calling for an objective psychology that would focus on behavior instead of consciousness. Cattell, speaking at the 1904 World's Fair in St. Louis, Missouri, said, Quote, I am not convinced that psychology should be limited to the study of consciousness. The rather widespread notion that there is no psychology apart from introspection is refuted by the brute argument of accomplished fact. It seems to me that most of the research work that has been done by me or in my laboratory is nearly as independent of introspection as work in physics or zoology. I see no reason why the application of systemized knowledge to the control of human nature may not, in the course of present century, be accomplished results commensurate with the 19th century applications of physical science to the material world, end quote. Watson was in the audience for Cattell's speech. The similarity between Cattell's talk and Watson's later public position is striking. One historian of psychology suggests that if Watson is the father of behaviorism, Cattell should be called the, the grandfather. Uh, of course, that's a hierarchy, but uh, anyways. In the decade before Watson formally founded behaviorism, the intellectual climate in the United States favored the idea of an objective psychology. Indeed, is, science, is psychology a science? Can it be scientific? Um, indeed, the overall movement of American psychology was in a behavioristic direction. Robert Woodworth, as we mentioned before, at Columbia University wrote that the American psychologists were, quote, slowly coming down with behaviorism as more and more of them from 1904 on expressed a preference for defining psychology as the science of behavior rather than as attempt to describe consciousness, end quote. In 1911, Walter Pillsbury, who had studied with Titchener, defined psychology in his textbook as the science of behavior. He argued that it was possible to treat human beings as objectively as any other aspect of the physical universe. And that the same year, Max Mayer published a book titled The Fundamental Laws of Human Behavior. William McDougall wrote Psychology with the subtitle The Study of Behavior in 1912. And Knight Dunlap, a psychologist at Johns Hopkins University, where Watson was teaching, proposed that the introspection, that introspection be banned from psychology. Also that year, William Montague, William Montague presented a paper titled, Has Psychology Lost Its Mind? to the APA's New York branch. Mon Montague spoke of moving to discard the, quote, concept of mind or consciousness and to substitute the concept of behavior as the sufficient object of psychological study, end quote. 
J.R. Engel at the University of Chicago, perhaps the most progressive of the functional psychologists, predicted that American psychology was ready for greater objectivity. In 1910, he com commented that it seemed possible that the term consciousness would disappear from psychology, much as the term soul had disappeared. Uh, three years later, shortly before the publication of Watson's Behaviorist Manifesto, Engel, in 1913, suggested that it would be profitable if consciousness were forgotten and animal and human behavior described objectively instead. Thus, the notion that psychology would be the science of behavior was already rapidly gaining in popularity. Watson's greatness was not in being the first to propose the idea, but seeing perhaps more clearly than anyone else at the time what the times were calling for. He responded boldly and articul articulately as the agent of a revolution whose inevitability and success were indubitably assured, because it was already underway.